Good evening. On behalf of KPCC and Southern California Public Radio, welcome to the Crawford Family Forum. Tonight's program features Dr. Richard Curran, Undersecretary for History, Art, and Culture, and Director of the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian Institution. He put together the splendid new book, The Smithsonian's History of America in 101 Objects. And talking with Dr. Curran this evening, please welcome John Neighbor, former Olympic athlete, sports broadcaster, and all-around history buff. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the Crawford Family Forum. Uh, my name is John Neighbor, and a personal thanks from me, first of all, to uh, Janice Wachi Hurst, who is our producer today, and of course, all of her team that are all dotted around here. This is after hours. They're working late on our behalf. And also, a personal shout out to Gordy and Donna Crawford, who provided this glorious facility in which we sit. So we're delighted to be here. And I'm honored to be able to introduce and interview our guest tonight. Uh, he was born in South Bronx, the son of a truck driver and a garment worker. He attended the State University of New York at Buffalo, and at 19 years of age, he decided to trek around India with a friend on a journey of anthropological and self-discovery. A professor suggested that he meet a certain lady at the American Museum of Natural History. She turned out to be the famous Margaret Mead. She also connected him to the museum where he found employment seeking out and collecting items for the museum. He told me over the phone a few days ago, I got to go to India and I got paid. <laughs> he returned to New York, earned a BA in anthropo anthropology and philosophy, and then he attended the University of Chicago pursuing graduate study in anthropology and specializing in the study of South Asia with field work in Pakistan. Eventually, he received his master's in anthropology and later his doctorate from the University of Chicago. He worked with the Smithsonian on the Festival of American Folklife for U.S. Bicentennial in 1976. And thanks to the cultural exhibitions there, he rekindled his love of museums and now he works for the Smithsonian Institution full-time. He is currently the Undersecretary for Art, History, and Culture, which includes the responsibility and oversight of, catch a breath, the National Museum of American History, the National Museum of American Indian History, the National Museum of American African American History and Culture, the National Postal Museum, the Anacostia Community, I can go on. I'm and, tired. And, uh, yeah, I know, it's exhausting, I apologize. He's authored over six books and over 100 scholarly articles, but he's no bookworm as he lettered in football in high school. His current hobbies include bocce ball and golf, and he recently uh, built a two-level deck with his daughters so he knows how to handle a saw and hammer and nails, and so we're delighted to have him with us. And we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about this wonderful book of his. Please welcome Dr. Richard Curran. Thank you, John, and thank you all. It's good to be here. Good to be in Los Angeles. Wonderful. On the, on the surface of it, it appeared to me that your job was to choose a list of items that could go into a time capsules for some future history discovery, but what was, what was your impression of the original mission of your, of your goal here? Well, it was difficult. You know, there was a, a, a fellow, uh, um, Neil McGregor, the head of the British Museum, who two years ago did a book, 100 Objects of World History, using the collection of the British Museum, and, and that was pretty successful. Publisher of that book said, you know, we really need to do something for this about America. Uh, Americans, you know, our knowledge of history is really ebbed. It's not taught that much in the schools anymore. We're a more diverse country. History is something that, that brings us together. Some of it is contentious, but it's very important that Americans know their history. Well, there we are sitting on the Mall in Washington with the National Museums of the United States, a great collection. If you want a time capsule, we have 137 million things in the Smithsonian. It's a big and capsule. It's a big capsule, and so the idea was uh, to use a book to do almost, a, you think of the book as a traveling exhibition of kind of uh, treasures of the Smithsonian that could help tell the whole broad story of America and hopefully influence teachers to teach it in class and for Americans to learn more. What was the process by which you narrowed 137 million down to 101? Oh, that was pretty difficult. We have uh, you know, hundreds of curators, scholars, and scientists at the Smithsonian, and I put out a call to my fellow curators around the, the, the institution, you know, people in the American History Museum, American Indian, and so on, what do you think should be in here? Well, of course, you can imagine the people at the National Postal Museum said, oh, 101 objects, well, how about 100 stamps? 
And the portrait gallery wanted all portraits, and everybody had a, everything. So we had to you know, pick and choose judiciously. I tried to cover the different periods of American history, and also the different themes, ranging from you know, politics and freedom, to invention, to popular culture, to civil rights, to really get a sweep of American history. Um, I also relied a lot on the American public. We get at the Smithsonian 30 million visitors a year. That's a lot of people. And Americans come to the museums and they gravitate towards certain objects. They want to see, you know, George Washington's uniform and sword and Abraham Lincoln's hat and, you know, the space shuttle and so on. So uh, I relied on, on what people, the public, largely the American public, uh, is interested in. Uh, and then I picked some items that were back of the house items that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, I have one item uh, from the American History Museum that actually has never, ever been exhibited to the public. So I wanted to throw in a few surprises, too. Now, is that a difficult decision, that you've got an item that you, you, you don't consider worthy of putting front stage, but it's worthy of being in the book? Is there, is there fights going on between you and your, your partners, your editors? And uh, well, the fights with the curators. I mean, we had some strong language, uh, you know, in terms of doing this. But I, I, I think this is an exi the, the, the one, and I'll, I'll show a, a photo of that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, the item in particular is called the Bakelizer. Uh, it's what the curator in our National Museum of American History calls the birthplace of the polyester kingdom. <laughs> this was the machine that made the first plastic, Bakelite. But it is so hideous. We don't want to scare our visitors to the Smithsonian. <laughs> it looks like it came from another planet, literally. Well, I know we've got a lot of people watching on our live feed, and of course our audience today, we want to get to some of the items. Here's a little uh, uh, fast-forward machine. Okay. You can walk us through the, the slideshow, and maybe I might ask a question every now and then. Okay, well, uh, yeah, and please please do, uh, uh, John. Uh, so many people have visited this. How many people here have visited the Smithsonian? Okay, a lot, everybody. Okay, so as you know, most of the museums are on the mall. We have two museums in New York. Uh, as well, 137 million items in the Smithsonian. That's a lot to get down to 101. The first item in the book is the fossils from the Burgess Shales. We inhabit this continent right now, but I wanted to give us, I wanted to give readers a perspective. These were the inhabitants of the continent 500 million years ago when it was just forming. 65,000 fossils in the Smithsonian that show what life was like in North America. And they are used as the basis of research to understand evolution and the process of the development of life. The, la whoop, the last object in the book, 101, is a telescope that hasn't been built yet. Now look at that arrow. It's pointing to a person. So you get a, 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 an idea of the scale of that. OK, so this is a little freaky. Just imagine, this is a telescope. You know when you look out in space, you're looking back in time, right? This telescope will allow us to look back 13 billion years, close to the Big Bang. It's being built by the Smithsonian, a consortium of uh, universities and other, other organizations. And so I wanted to bookend the book by something 500 million years ago and something that was really a futuristic object that will enable us really to see to the edge of the universe. So I, I want to put American history in a perspective. We really are a blink of an eye in the history of the universe. Is that in the Smithsonian, though? Is there a model of it in the Smithsonian? There's models, and, and basically this is being built in China. We fabricated three of the, uh, the, the, these uh, lenses so far. Uh, it will be finally done in 2020, which is a pretty good you know, year for if you're looking at <laughs> seeing far. Great. Uh, one of the items that Clovis points, people know about the origins of, of Indian life in the continent. And one, one of the points I wanted to make in this is the stuff in the Smithsonian is not just stuff. Stuff is a technical term we use for a collection. <laughs> but we do research on that all the time. And one of our scientists right now, Dennis Stanford, is trying to figure out the origins of American Indians and where they are. So he's using those arrow points that you will see in the collection that tell us about early Indian life uh, on the continent to figure out migration patterns to the New World. Uh, as you'd expect in this book, I deal with Columbus and uh, the first uh, mission, uh, the, uh, the, the paintings that we used when the missions were settled in, uh, in New Mexico, in California, to Pocahontas, to in the book, and in the Smithsonian, everything is in the Smithsonian, is a piece of Plymouth Rock. And then things like slave shackles that tell a harsh story about our country. In the Smithsonian is an interesting copy of the Declaration of Independence that actually ruined the original, but that's another story. George Washington's uniform and sword, 
Ben Franklin's hat. And when I was doing the research for this, I was learning. I'm not a specialist in American history, but I was learning tremendous amounts. So I looked at this Benjamin Franklin walking stick that we have. Curious enough, Franklin wrote a codicil to his will a year before Washington, before he died, and he left this to George Washington, my good friend. He said, this could have been the scepter of a king. Instead, it is a stick crowned by the cap of liberty. Well, I didn't know what the heck Benjamin Franklin was talking about. But if you look at top of that, that gold stick, this was given to him by a French lady after the Americans won the Revolutionary War, that decorative piece is actually modeled after Ben Franklin's fur cap. So here's something that a king, you know, George Washington could have had a crown, instead he's given this stick with a fur cap on top of it. I will tell everybody I've read many of the uh, items in the book, and it's not just a list of the items, but it's how the items came to be, how the items came to in the possession of the Smithsonian Institute, and there's a lot of all, uh, ancillary trivia throughout each page. It's beautifully written. It's not just footnotes and annotations, but it's wonderful anecdotes. So tell some more. These this are is not my dissertation. This is really an accessible history. Uh, so my, uh, my uh, mother and my aunts and everybody could uh, read it and have access to it. It would be it. a wonderful holiday gift if yeah. you're thinking about something. Yeah, like and it's hefty. It's five pounds of history. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's worth uh, Everybody knows what this is, right? This is the Star Spangled Banner, not sewn by Betsy Ross. Total myth. <laughs> but this is the flag. When we, we go to stadiums or watch uh, sports on TV every Saturday, this is the flag we sing about. Oh, say, can you see? This is the flag. Uh, that Francis Scott Key saw it over Fort McHenry on September 14, 1814, when the future of the United States was in doubt. And in Dawn's early light, he didn't see a British Union Jack. He saw this flag, the Star Spangled Banner. Look what it looked like when it came to the Smithsonian in 1907. Pretty ragtag. We love this to death, almost like a relic. We had seamstresses sew 1.7 million stitches to help save it, put it on linen, and that helped save the flag. And then, in the 1990s, we had to take out 1.7 million stitches because those were ruining the flag. <laughs> and with a great, deal of, uh, a great deal of support from our, our board and generous donors and people who really care about the museum and our collection, and I think tonight I'd like to thank uh, one of the members of the board of our uh, National Museum of uh, American History is here, uh, Barry Meyer, the head of uh, uh, Warner Brothers. Uh, who's been a great supporter, and along with others, you know, in a voluntary way, helps the Smithsonian preserve our treasures and make them accessible to future generations. Now, when you go see that flag, it's really inspirational. It makes the hair on your, the back of your neck stand up to realize what that is. I do remember an instance when I did see the Star Spangled Banner rise up in front of a crowd, and the hair on the back of my neck did go up because they were giving me a gold medal. <laughs> it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time. Yeah. <clears throat> Please, tell us some more. Uh, Conestoga Wagon helped uh, settle America and bring goods around, brought people out here. Uh, Lewis and Clark's compass, of course, this is the compass made in Philadelphia that helped these guys in the Corps of, Discover of Discovery get across the country uh, after the Louisiana Purchase. The cotton gin, which, you know, I, I mean, you know, expanded cotton production, the U.S. economy, particularly in the South, but also led to the increase of slavery in this country. Uh, you know, we have uh, the sewing machine, the Singer sewing machine, but when you think about it, we have all these other models. I, I think here is depicted, what, 16 different models of sewing machine, all to figure out how to connect two pieces of fabric together. But what you see in America is points of creativity when a whole lot of people are working on the same notion and trying to figure out how to invent. And I think that's been one of the characteristics of America. It's a great lesson. You know, we see problems, we see issues, and Americans try to fix them. And the sewing machine is a great example. I love this one. This is the John Bull. This is the first locomotive. Now, it wasn't built in the United States. It was built in Britain. And the guys in New Jersey that had to assemble this, the first railroad in the US was in New Jersey, commercial railroad, 1831. They had never seen a locomotive. Imagine getting this in pieces and having to put it together and make it work, which they did. Well, when they did, they found that the track had been hastily laid, so they invented this uh, thing at the front of the train to help guide the rails. And we have in the Smithsonian archival records of, of what it was like to ride that train. There's a guy, John Frazee, he was a, a, a sculptor. He's writing a letter to his wife. He was on the train. He drew the train, you can see. And he says, you can't believe it. I was sitting on this train. It was belching smoke. It was so loud, it gave me a headache. And then it took off like a shot, 15 miles an hour. <laughs> But Whip at that line. time, that was a shot. <laughs> 
Well, this other, this other photo is not some old-timey people riding an old train. This is our curators from the Smithsonian. 150 years after this train was, was built and put together in the United States, our curators said, can we take it out of the Smithsonian, out of the museum, and take it for a ride? How about that? See, that's the fun. If you're a curator, you can have some fun. And so we got a crane. We took the, the train out. We put it near Georgetown by the canal. It was railroad track. Lifted the train, took it to that track. And these, firing up and running the steam locomotive 150 years later, were curators from the Smithsonian. And they had a ball. And it ran. And, and it, it still worked. ran. It still Son ran. It gun. still works. So um, uh, uh, there's a Colt revolver, of course, that helped win the West. Um, wonderful collection also here at the uh, Autry uh, uh, Center as well. Uh, the telegraph that we had, you know, when the, uh, it's interesting in the book because I go into some of these inventions and how they didn't quite turn out the way people originally thought. Unintended consequences. The telegraph you see at the top is the key, right? We're all familiar with telegraph key, dot, 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 dash, dash, dash. But the first telegraphs were really more like fax machines. They ran a paper through, and so you see at the bottom a register and a long piece of paper, long, thin, narrow piece of paper. Basically, the telegraph would hit the paper and do dot, dot, dash, and people would read the paper. Well, what happened? After about 15 minutes of doing telegraphs, the people would listen and be able to hear the dots and dashes. They didn't need the paper. So that part of the invention disappears. This is something I love. This is what made California. This was what James Marshall saw on that morning in January 1848, a glint of gold at Sutter's Mill. This is the original gold flake, the first one that started the gold rush. It's in the Smithsonian. Now, how big is this? Now, on the screen, that looks like a big chunk of gold. Look at your pinky finger. It's probably about, oh, one-tenth the size of your pinky finger. It is so small. So to realize something so small had such incredible impact. And that was the first. It was brought all the way to Washington from California um, you know, by land and sea. It was delivered to President Polk at the time. And this, was, uh, this opened up uh, California. What I'm trying to understand, though, is the guy who discovers this flake, he says, I'm going to be rich. Let me sell it. <laughs> or no, I'm going to save it and ship it out to President Polk? Yeah, well, that was, uh, you know, th th there was other gold there. <laughs> OK, but this was the first one. <laughs> and this one. is the first one. And this authenticated, you know, this was the authentication. So it was actually the army got involved, other people got involved. And uh, there it is in the Smithsonian, specimen number one brought to the, brought to the present. Uh, the, um, this one, of course, very moving, Lincoln's top hat, uh, very mythic. You know, Lincoln was six foot four. So he was a tall guy. So to wear a top hat, which gave him respectability. At that time, uh, you know, Prince, uh, Prince uh, Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, was wearing top hats. It was very urbane. So when you think about fur caps in the US and you know, at, the, at the frontier, this was a different kind of hat. It gave Lincoln sophistication and standing. Now, Union generals and Union troops were a little upset at him wearing this hat. It made him a bigger target. This is the hat that he wore on April 14th 1865 to Ford's Theater. He put it on the sign, sat down on the chair, watched the play, and was assassinated. And then later it came to the Smithsonian. We actually put it in the basement for many years, decades, because the head of the Smithsonian was worried that it would be kind of you know, taken as almost a saintly martyr relic. And so he was worried about the undue emotion to it. Um, I, I think that's very poignant also, because as that thick black band, that was something that Lincoln personally added to it. And his son Willie had died, 1862, when they were in the White House. And so here he publicly wears this mourning band on his hat at the same time when, you know, really millions of American families, north and south, were mourning the loss of their sons. I'm, I'm curious that they took the locomotive out for a spin. When some curator is holding that hat, is there a temptation to sort of <laughs> put yeah. it on your head? I think not really with the hat. You know, it, it's so, you could see perspiration marks on it. I mean, when you touch it, you're touching Lincoln. You're t you know, I think that's the thing about objects. You know, when we deal with history, and a lot of us learned history as dates and places and things we had to memorize. In, in Virginia, you got to memorize, like, who's all the justices of the Supreme Court? I didn't even know Virginia had a Supreme Court. But when you're holding these objects, you're really touching history. You're there. It transports you. 
And I think that's what the best of a museum exhibit or a museum display does. It really brings history to you. If there was one item that had no controversy and complete agreement, would that be it? Well, you know, he was who assassinated. Could argue, who could <laughs> argue? Who could so, argue with that? that yeah, no, I think as a as an iconic object. Now we do have at the Smithsonian in the book. I talk about another piece of headgear that we have connected to this hat, which were the, um, uh, you know, Shroud. the, shrouds the shrouds of the conspirators that they, they were worn. They had to wear every day while they were imprisoned, and they wore when they were hanged. So you know, the contrast between those uh, those uh, shrouds and this hat is. Uh, quite moving. Uh, we have a lot of Civil War uh, uh, objects, and we really tell the history. Uh, looking at Frederick Douglass, the early Ambrotypes photography was new, relatively new in the Civil War. And Frederick Douglass really used the image, the imaging of African Americans to dispel a lot of stereotypes. He was very cognizant of that. Uh, Harriet Tubman's hymnal, a hymnal that was responsible you know, for her work and guided her work on the Underground Railroad. This little copy of the Emancipation Proclamation, I love this one because this was produced in the hundreds of thousands and distributed to soldiers, Union soldiers, you know, toward the, uh, after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in 1863. This was what was read to people in the field. This was so soldiers could say those words and end slavery. It was, it's, it's amazing, you know, what, where, where, where these little booklets were. Um, Albert Bierstadt, there's art in the book, Albert Bierstadt's vision of California. This is what Albert Bierstadt and others, like Moran and everybody else, artists from the East, made these mythic pictures of California in the West to sell the West to the East. And people wanted to know, remember, no TV, no movies, this was it, you know. Really captured that mythic nature of the, of the West. So this would be like a text or a Twitter. You'd just send out a <laughs> signal and draw people in. Yeah, and, and he actually used them that way. He, you know, charged $5 a piece to look, and you know, this, this canvas is quite big. It's, I, I guess, about half the size of the screen, maybe a little bigger than half the size, and people would pay $5 to look at those paintings of, of California back east. Um, Alexander Graham Bell's first telephone. Look at his first telephone and then think about your cell phone. <laughs> this is where it began. Come here, Watson, I need you. Right? Yeah, that was it. Or Ed Edison's first light bulb, to light up the world. Just imagine what it is to think about a world without electric light. You know, the fires, the things that it's made possible. Um, really major things. Of course, the Ford Model T, uh, one of the largest selling vehicles ever, certainly at that time, and made cars, made automobiles affordable. And I think Ford said you can have it in any color you like as long as it's black. Black, and that's what Henry Ford wanted, black. And, you know, the, the, the rolling production line made possible, you know, rolling these out every few seconds. So it really made the Industrial uh, Revolution possible. The Wright Brothers Kitty Hawk Flyer, we have the original in the Smithsonian. That was repaired a few times by the Wright Brothers to get it. And it was a big adventure getting this. We almost did it. Where else would it go? That's what I don't understand. Who else Well, it, there was a little controversy between the Wright brothers and the head of the Smithsonian at the time. He thought he had the first plane that flew. Of course, his plane kind of flew for about a second and a half and went into the Potomac River. <laughs> but uh, uh, loyalists at the Smithsonian want to put up a label that says his plane was capable of flight. The Wright brothers were a little peeved at that. And so they actually took their, their plane and they sent it to London, to the Science Museum where it stayed through World War II. Charles Lindbergh got involved in trying to, you know, get the Wright brothers in the Smithsonian to make up. And finally, the Smithsonian took down the offensive sign and Wright brothers aircraft came to us. There you go. I mean, you know, we, we take some things in history as non-problematic or matter of fact, but, you know, sometimes they're quite contentious about how they get there. Um, this is an object that I really love. It's in our National Museum of American History. Everybody knows who Bernice Palmer is, right? Nobody knows who Bernice Palmer is, but you know about Browning cameras. And Browning cameras developed in the early 1900s enabled people to take pictures. Before that, you know, you needed, you know, the big apparatus and the chemicals and the, 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 whole, the whole shebang. Brownies made it possible for everybody to do it, kind of like today with everybody's cell phone and, you know, the, the iPhone and so on that you could take pictures with. Bernice Palmer was a 17-year-old girl. She got a Brownie camera for her birthday in 1912. Then her, she and her mother went on a, 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 were going on a cruise to Europe. They got on a ship called the Carpathia. They were just out in Atlantic. They got a distress call from the Titanic. Come and rescue the survivors. 
And so it was Bernice Palmer. Here's a 17-year-old girl with a brownie camera, and she's the one that takes the pictures of the disaster. So it's a little hard to tell on the screen, but that's a picture of the iceberg that she took, picture of the survivors, and many, many other pictures. And when she got back to New York on the Carpathia, that's who the press clamored after, can we have your brownie camera, can we develop? And it's her pictures that went around the world. It just shows you know, how you know, a relatively normal thing and a regular person could play a major role in documenting history. So I really like that one. Did she go on to a career of photography? No, she did, oh, okay. she did not. And in fact, when we got the camera, she donated the camera to us when she was 87 years old. It still had film in it. <laughs> <laughs> we showed it off at a Regents meeting. The, the Smithsonian is uh, overseeing, you know, we're a kind of funny agency. We're public and private, a, a mix. But the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is the Chancellor of the Smithsonian. The Vice President is on the Board of Regents. Other Senators, Representatives, and a number of private citizens. And when we showed off that camera, you know, the Regents sat there, and they were like a gap. There's still film in it? Have you developed it? <laughs> We ended up doing it, but there wasn't anything on it. <laughs> too bad, too, <laughs> too bad. bad. Uh, there's, I, I deal with American music, and certainly if you're talking about American music, jazz is the preeminent, you know, the, the really unique creation of Americans out of New Orleans, a melange of, of culture, of, of black and white, religious and secular, uh, and Louis Armstrong's trumpet is in the collection of the Smithsonian. And you don't just talk about the items, you also talk about uh, the, I interesting trivia for me. The origin of the word satchmo, does anybody know that? There's yeah. a few, tell us about it. Well, I, I think he was called, he, he, he ascribed it to satchel mouth, you know, you know, having a big cheeks and everything. And then uh, when he was on tour, he, uh, they started, he started calling his, uh, uh, his instrument uh, satchmo. And so it became associated both with him and, and his instrument. Of course, he was a great ambassador for American music around the world. Uh, and in this country, whoop. Forgot the spirit of St. Louis, we don't want to do that, uh, which you know, came into the Smithsonian. And if you go in the Smithsonian, that's hanging in the Air and Space Museum on the Mall, and you look up at that, and you say, wow, what an achievement. Now, in the book, I dealt with Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart, because they were both tremendous pioneers uh, of air, air flight. Can you go back? Show us, there was a whole bunch of flags on the yeah. Spirit of St. Louis. What's the story between them? Yeah, that? these are on the cowling. Now, they weren't on the Spirit of St. Louis when Lindbergh made his transatlantic journey, you know, from New York to Paris. These flags, after he made the trip, the Spirit of St. Louis went on tour around the country and to other countries. And so that's when you had other flags being put on them. And they really attuned. What, what, what Lindbergh's signal achievement was, was not only his transatlantic uh, uh, flight, but what he did by doing that. When this went around, all of a sudden, millions of Americans, I think they estimated something like one quarter of all Americans saw that plane firsthand. And before that, you did not have air travel as a popular form of transportation. But after that, people really got attuned to air travel. And it was really because of this plane being seen and touched and looked at uh, by millions and millions of Americans. Well, those millions of people didn't know about the TSA at the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway. yeah. The, um, this, uh, you like, I mean, a radio personality. This was the microphone that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt used, one of the microphones he used for his fireside chats. Now, before that, the company was always called Columbia. And, but NBC was very, very good. When they did the fireside chats, NBC would do uh, um, NBC, and you could read it in the newspaper. You could read it in a, in a photo. Columbia, too long a word, can't read. So CBS changed their, uh, their kind of logo on this, did CBS, and that's, uh, that's one of the microphones we have. We also have an NBC microphone, in all fairness. Well, here's something close to home. You know, You're in California, folks. The ruby slippers, uh, you know, which uh, one of the pairs came to the Smithsonian. Uh, there are, I, I believe, uh, four known pairs. Uh, again, I thank uh, Warner, uh, Warner Brothers for enabling us to use the, uh, the, the photograph and image for that. Uh, you know, these are the slippers that you know, have entertained generations of Americans and speak to a kind of myth of our country, you know, you know a, a myth of you know, kind of goodness and uh, the power of, uh, of, of, of home, um, and uh, uh, as well as of exploration, of overcoming, you know, all sorts of uh, 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 challenges. Uh, but this is, these are the shoes that, um, um, you know, were, uh, 
used for the Wizard of Oz. But if the movie had been made three years earlier, we, they'd look black and white because uh, Wizard of Oz was one of the first color films. It was, right after Snow White was a big hit, and then uh, um, uh, MGM thought that, you know, Technicolor was the way to go. Technicolor was a new invention. Now, if you read Frank Baum's story, you know, The Wizard of Oz, uh, written around the turn of the century, well before the, you know, the film was shot in 1938, came out in 1939, uh, but when the book was written, the shoes were silver. And there's been a good deal of academic writing on that, the yellow brick road standing for the gold standard, the silver shoes standing for the silver standard, the wizard is the president, Oz is Washington. Not unlike today a bit <laughs> in terms of thinking about how we think in, in terms of parodies and so on. Uh, but the, the, shoe, the slippers were supposed to be silver. They were always silver. And then in 1938, as they're reworking the, uh, the, the, the script, all of a sudden they're ruby slippers, and it shows up on Technicolor. Now, when you look at them, actually, they are, this is how they look kind of in, when they're photographed under light and on the camera, but actually the sequence, and it's all sequence on a, a, a pair of commercially bought pumps, uh, right here in Culver City was where this was put together. Um, they're actually a little on the brown, orange, burgundy side, you know, they're, they're not, but, but given the lights and given the filming technique, they really shine as ruby. And, and the different pairs were made because one needed to be dancing, one needed to be walking, they had felt to make it quiet, they had... And so how do you know which one that was? Are they the clicking in the heels? Yeah, you know? those are, well, we know those are the dance ones because they, uh, uh, they had felt on the bottom. So okay. as they were doing the sound, that would, uh, uh, you wouldn't get the, uh, the, you know, the sound of the dance floor. They kind of hushed that sound. Um, there was one pair that was worn by her uh, backup backup actors, so they're different sizes. Oh my. You know, and uh, people estimate, I think the original pair, this cost $15 to make. I think it auctioned, they were auctioned, they were up for auction about two years ago. Uh, it was eventually bought, but the auction asking price was $2 million. <laughs> Not a bad investment. Good investment. <laughs> and the studio gave these to the uh, institution. Uh, a donor gave those. A to donor gave those. Yes, That's yeah, remarkable. Yeah, yeah, it came through the studio and it went through auction. Then a donor donated. Um, this I love. Uh, again, another Los Angeles connection. Actually, with this one, Woody Guthrie's "This Land Is Your Land." You know, Woody Guthrie was a Los Angeles uh, radio personality. Sung on the air here, had a show, uh, then went back to New York. Uh, among other things, wrote a song called "This Land Is Your Land." It became kind of an alternative national anthem. Richard, if you'll indulge me, I do yeah. have a brief anecdote about this particular song because I was part of an international team and we were competing o overseas and we all met in the locker room and the Americans were in the shower and the acoustics were so good we couldn't help but sing and we sang, get out of that kitchen and rattle those pots and well, we're singing along and a Russian swimmer is sort of looking at us and I knew he could speak a little English and I said, is there any song you'd like us to sing? And he goes, this land is your land, this land is my land. <laughs> and that's the song he chose. And I believe uh, Woody Guthrie was sympathetic to the socialist movement. He was politically He was. Active. He was probably a communist and a socialist. And then, of course, he joined the Merchant Marines and uh, fought for the U.S. Hmm. So, um, you know, interesting uh, apotheosis there. And we have the original acetate recording that he did for a fellow named Moses Ash, who started a recording company called uh, uh, Folkways Records. Uh, Mo Ash was influenced uh, by Albert Einstein, who said, Mo, why don't you record the sounds of the universe? <laughs> All the people on the planet and everything else. And he tried to do that. This one is a very poignant object. Notice the date. This is a hand stamp. This is a postal hand stamp. You see the date? December 6th, 1941. This was from the USS Oklahoma that was sunk at Pearl Harbor. The servicemen that would handle the postage and the letters home and back and forth from that ship came in that Sunday morning at Pearl Harbor. They didn't get a chance to change the date. So. In, the, in the choosing the process, do you find this item and say we have to include it? Or do you say let's do something that has to do with Pearl Harbor? What do we have? Yeah, I, I think kind of both. You know, you're, uh, you know, museum curators are always trying to do that in, in exhibitions. You're trying to always find something that's an object that could stand for a larger whole in a kind of profound way. Sometimes it's because of its beauty, sometimes because of its celebrity who touched it, you know, Lincoln's hat, for example, 
uh, as, a, as an icon for uh, Lincoln. And then sometimes you get something like this that's so simple, you know, such an everyday thing, and yet tells such a big, poignant story on it. And it reminds us, it makes us feel that we are actually watching history. We're, we're there. Yeah, not very much. You can see that stamp in reverse, you know, on a letter home by uh, people on that ship. Uh, to Spirit of Tuskegee, uh, great, so th this has been donated to our new National Museum of African American History and Culture. This was bought, this was a wreck. It was used as a crop duster. Uh, and then there was an ex-Air Force guy, and he and his wife wanted to restore an aircraft. They, they got this very cheap at auction. It was all wrecked. And then they figured, you know, we should look at the serial number and figure out where this plane was used and where it was from. Well, they found out this was the plane that had been used very early on at Tuskegee in Alabama to train the Tuskegee Airmen. And so instead of restoring it in the way they wanted to do it, use it for shows, they restored it to its condition as a Tuskegee Air Trainer. Then they would take Tuskegee Airmen up in it, go to reunions, all the Tuskegee Airmen would sign it. And then they figured, you know, it's really, this is bigger than us. And so they took a final flight uh, from Tuskegee uh, to Washington and they donated it to the Smithsonian. It's pretty amazing. What, do they roll it up and hand you the keys? <laughs> we uh, actually, uh, yeah, it's right now it's ac actually out at our uh, uh, Dulles facility at the Udvar Hazy Center. So, you know, the, the Smithsonian, you know, really relies on citizens, on people to, you know, donate material that's significant and tells that, that, that story. And, it, you know, it's just marvelous how people come forward. Love this one, of course, we can do it. You think it's Rosie the Riveter, right? It was not Rosie the River. <laughs> Rosie the River, this came out in 42, it was shown for a while. Rosie the Riveter's song came out, became a popular uh, 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 character. Norman Rockwell did a wonderful uh, 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 painting for it. And then, only later, with the development of the women's movement, did you get retroactively this being called Rosie the Riveter. But originally, she was not called Rosie the Riveter. Oh, so you gotta kinda track history. This, this portrait offers a striking contrast to that one because this is a woman in a um, Japanese internment camp. And she's holding a baby, uh, her baby. She's looking at the, fo the photo of her husband who's probably serving in the 442nd. And so while Japanese Americans in this state, in California, and other places were interned during the war, uh, people like Dan Inouye and other Japanese Americans were fighting for this country. And there she is, you know, her husband in the war, and she's being watched over by a guard tower in that painting. It's, uh, you know, again, to me, one of those moving objects that kind of tell a big story. As a curator, do you, if you were in the museum, I guess you'd probably get as much interest out of looking at the people looking at the painting and see some commonalities or see the emotion in their face. That, that happens, you know, with this painting, we had this on display for uh, an exhibit we did for the um, bicentennial of the American Constitution. And in, uh, uh, in 1987, we had this exhibit a more per toward a more perfect union. And the idea was to look at the whole episode of Japanese internment, which raised, you know, major constitutional issues. And, uh, and again, was eventually decided by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. So we kind of looked at this case as a way of reinforcing the notion of our rights as Americans. And, and people would look at it and say, yeah, no, now I get it, I understand. But also we want people to understand the fervor of the time, sure. and the, you know, the, the, the fear of the time. Uh, Audie Murphy's Eisenhower jacket, you know, a hero, but I, Eisenhower was an was a interesting general, interesting president, but he was very attuned to style. <laughs> And he personally, you know, made the, you know, his jacket. He wanted to look snappy. It was practical, but also snappy. The Enola Gay, another tough story, you know, about the uh, bombing of Hiroshima. Uh, and that's in the, uh, in, in the Smithsonian. And that's one, too, where, as you say, people looking at the bomber, many people are grateful, have ended the war. Uh, so when they come to the museum, they look at it in that kind of way. But other people look at it, say, you know, this was, a lot of people were, were killed, and this started the uh, atomic age. We, I, I talk about the controversies at the Smithsonian in displaying the Enola Gay. This is the fourth airplane we've seen so far. Yeah. Is there a, an affinity for planes, and, and well, where do you put them all? They're awfully big items. For yeah, a well, that's why we have two air and space museums, <laughs> one on the Mall, the original, and then one over at Dulles, the Udvar-Hazy Center. And uh, the Hazy Center is amazing because it's this huge hangar. 
And basically, you go in there and you can walk up to any one of 400 planes, touch them up close. So, uh, you know, and, and, and I think Americans have, again, it's been one of those things, just like we have trains and Model Ts and stuff, the idea of, you know, what we've done in space and in the air has really led the world, and, and that's been very important. Uh, fallout shelter from, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Cold War era, Whoop. Jackie Kennedy's uh, gown, a big hit at the Smithsonian. I'm, I'm a guy, I'm not really into fashion, but I think this is beautiful. <laughs> uh, and I had met Jackie Kennedy when she came to the Smithsonian. We, we had done some things uh, together. And then you talked about Julia Child's kitchen. What city are we in, folks? Pasadena, that's where she, that's where she started. So, so the curators went up to Julia Child. Julia Child knew the head of the Smithsonian. Julia Child had served in the OSS, the predecessor to the uh, CIA during World War II, served in Sri Lanka, among other places. She was friends, actually, with the head of the Smithsonian, Dylan Ripley, the guy that originally ha hired me. So she was kind of partial. We knew she was going to retire. Uh, she lived in Cambridge. This was her kitchen in Cambridge, where she did the uh, WGBH show, filmed out of it. Specially built for her, she was tall, tall counters and so on. And so she was uh, going to move back to Santa Barbara, and so we got in touch with her. Again, she was partial to the Smithsonian. She said, come on up. Our curators went up. We thought, OK, Julia Child will collect some pots and pans. We'll collect a few utensils, garland stove, maybe. She was such a great curator. You know, ju just as you get from her shows, you know, the, the kind of discipline and the sense of knowledge that she had, everything was in a place. Everything was there for a purpose. Our curators decided. They couldn't collect just a few pots and pans. They needed to collect the whole kitchen, including the sink. <laughs> including the kitchen sink. That, did, is that where that came from? I don't know. <laughs> so that was an uh, you know, uh, amazing uh, story. Uh, one of my favorite objects, Neil Armstrong's spacesuit. You know, one, it's mythic qualities. I mean, it allowed human beings to walk on the moon. Who would have thought of a thing? But the other one is, and, and in the book, I, just like with all the other objects, as you say, John, I tell the kind of backstory. So on one hand, you can celebrate the, the great quality of this, allowed things to walk on the moon. When it was first designed, spacesuits, you know, people were designing spacesuits for NASA. It was all aluminum, fiberglass, very heavy. You couldn't move. Uh, if you remember, it was like going, uh, me in the East in New York going ice skating. My mother would dress me up. I couldn't move. Sweaters, jackets, everything. You couldn't move. That would not serve you well on the moon. You needed something that was flexible. So NASA holds a competition. Different firms vie for who's going to make the spacesuit. Who wins? International Latex Corporation, better known as Playtex. The ladies' undergarments. So as one critic said in this great line, Neil Armstrong took a large step for mankind and even a larger step for ladies' underwear. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the notion of flexibility and layers. So, you know, sometimes creativity comes from unknown quarters, I think. You know, it's really interesting. I interviewed uh, John Carlos, mm -hmm. one of the two Olympians with the fist in the air for the 1968 Olympics. He was watching Neil Armstrong walking to the, uh, to the air capsule. And this is the introduction also, I think, of, of uh, Velcro. They were oh, using yeah. Velcro on, on tabs. And he was trying to tie up his shoelaces, and he wanted a lace that would be easy to tie and untie quickly. And he picked up the phone and called his shoe sponsor and said, can you make those out of Velcro? And they did. Those were the shoes he wore at the Olympic trials, where he sets a world record, which wasn't broken until Michael Johnson wore the golden shoes in Atlanta. It was an amazing story with the yeah. Velcro. So it is, yeah, and, and, and you know, and how creativity spreads. Uh, items of civil rights, certainly the Greensboro lunch counter, we took that from Woolworths in Greensboro. We took an eight-foot section out of there, where students had sat down and sat in to stand up for freedom. Things like the Bob Dylan poster, uh, Cesar Chavez's Union Jacket and Short Ho, so instrumental in the farm workers movement, uh, a section of the AIDS quilt, you know, that when it's been on the mall is, you know, I think the largest piece of folk art ever created by humankind. It stretches for miles. Um, sell from Mickey Mouse Steamboat Willie. <laughs> Sleeping on that soap, if you remember the scene. Uh, donated by the uh, Disney folks. and uh, That wasn't just the first Mickey Mouse, wasn't it? Oh, um, I'm thinking the it, first animated it, it was. It wasn't the first. There were two others before Steamboat Willie, but Steamboat Willie was the one that was animated. That's where you had the song with it, and that's the one that became the hit and really gave Disney his, uh, 
his breakthrough. Uh, you know, just before the program, uh, you know, you, I, Barry Meyer, and others, were, we were looking at an old television set here and remembering what it was like to watch those small screens. Well, when you watch the first television created by RCA, you didn't watch the television screen. You looked at a mirror in which it was projected. Uh, we have Chuck Berry's Maybelline guitar, you know, Gibson guitar, uh, Catherine Hepburn's Oscars, again, something that resonates in this... Uh, 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 here. And what your picture shows is they're different. Yeah. They're not the same every year. They change. So you can yeah. identify them by the, by the year? Yes. and Well, certainly by the inscription, but the first one she won in, in 1935 for a 1934 film uh, very early on. And that's when publicly it started being called Oscar, you know, as the, uh, it wasn't an official name or anything. But uh, that was made out of uh, uh, gold-plated bronze. Later it became uh, Britannium. And uh, during the war, World War II years, it was actually plastic. After World War, uh, plaster, sorry, not plastic, plaster. Uh, after World War II, uh, they became taller. They became what? Taller. Oh, oh, I see. So that's okay. why you have the uh, different uh, sizes. Marilyn Monroe's, you know, depiction by Andy Warhol. How can we not do McDonald's and fast food, a great American invention? Why did you choose the Japanese lettering? Well, to, because to show it's multicultural? Yeah, lettering? exactly. And the fact that here's something that Americans created that went around the world. You know, and that's gone around the world. It, you know, kind of stood for globalization, I think, in, in terms of product. How can I not do R2-D2 and C-3PO? Uh, which at the Smithsonian, these were not robots. These were costumes. And when we got this from uh, Lucas, uh, you know, his thing is, be sure not to put them in the attic. <laughs> so those are uh, on display, and actors would get into these and, uh, and Can do donors them. make those kinds of demands? I guess when you're George Lucas, you yeah. can. <laughs> but you get a lot, I mean, 137 million items, yeah. not every item can be on display. No, and, and you know, please don't start sending us all sorts of things. <laughs> Uh, again, with very conditions. Few, very few. Well, you know, one percent of the items in a collection are on display at any one time. We do rotate things, but you know, we'll often advise that something might be appropriate for a local museum or regional museum, which is absolutely true, and it'll get more play and it can tell a bigger story sometimes. You know, likely not, not everything has to be in the Smithsonian. And when you get into the storage areas of the Smithsonian, if you remember that scene in that first Indiana Jones film. You know, when they're storing the ark and they say the best people are taking care of it, you see that cavernous, massive place? That's what it's like. <laughs> Smithsonian has 19 buildings, 19 museums, and 850 buildings. We need to store a lot of stuff, everything from giant squid to dinosaur bones to meteorites. So it's a lot. And Apple computers and other computers and the ENIAC computers and IBM. and. Uh, uh, a lot of artwork on display, certainly. This one gave the name the Electronic Superhighway when we started talking about the internet. This was done by actually a Korean immigrant uh, on display at the American Art Museum. And then another poignant object, I think, the Berlin Wall, a piece of the Berlin Wall, a fragment. We almost all can remember when the wall came down. And you talk about s stories about how the items actually get to the Smithsonian. Fred Ryan is mentioned in this chapter, and he's uh, went to school with Fred. Tell us a little bit about these stories. Yeah, well, you know, the Berlin Wall was built in, uh, what, uh, 1961. It was built to keep people in, in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, Winston Churchill, you know, called the, the Iron Curtain. This was really a stone concrete wall about 12 feet tall and 100 miles uh, long uh, and kept people from the, the West uh, in Berlin. And, um, you know, Reagan had gone to, uh, to Berlin and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down the wall. I think we can kind of see it in our mind's eye on TV. And um, uh, there was an assistant he had with him, John Rogers. Fred Ryan also worked for the uh, uh, Reagan White House. At Chief the, of Staff in his after White yeah. House. So basically, when the wall came down in 89, uh, here you had these, these uh, uh, guys who had served their country, served in the White House, served with President Reagan. And they kind of, they couldn't believe that the wall came down. A lot of people couldn't believe the wall finally came down. So they went on their own dime. They were that, uh, uh, John Rogers uh, uh, had been in the White House, uh, Fred Ryan, uh, two other friends. They went to Berlin to see for themselves the dismantling of the wall. Well, they're in West Berlin. They come across a guy, and here's a guy with a pick. You know, like, knocking down the wall. And they never thought in their life they would see this wall come down. He said, you want a piece? <laughs> 
you want to join in? And here they helped dismantle the Berlin Wall. And so Fred and John and others took back pieces of the, of the wall. And actually for the book, I want, this was a case where I really needed to include the Berlin Wall and we didn't have a piece at the Smithsonian. And I knew John, I had heard this story. I knew John had a piece. I said, John, we're going to press with the book. I need this donation. <laughs> Get in your basement, find that piece of the Berlin Wall, and deliver it to the Smithsonian. And he did. Uh, John is uh, chief of staff over at Goldman Sachs uh, in his other life, but has been a great chair of the board at the American uh, History Museum. Yeah, all the items in the book are, are, are belong to the Smithsonian. They're not on loan. No, no, well, every, everything belongs. And in the book, I go through some things that are in other museums as ancillary projects that help uh, explain it. Uh, these are very poignant. Uh, you know, the Smithsonian became the collecting unit after 9-11. And so uh, the, the primary object I use in the book is this fire engine door that was collected that showed, you know, what happened to first responders. Uh, but there were uh, uh, coins from the Pentagon that were fused, sheathing from the World Trade Center, a, uh, uh, a flight attendant's logbook from Flight 93 that went into Shanksville that really resonated with, uh, with me. Uh, my sister-in-law, Clary uh, 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 Miller Krinsky, is here tonight, and she, uh, she was a flight attendant on, uh, on American, and she knew the folks that were on that flight. And so it just, you know, like many Americans, I mean, you know, Smithsonian people are not inured, you know, to the events in our history. We like to celebrate the great events, but, you know, we also have to collect and document those tough times in our history. Um, Shepard Ferry, a Los Angeles-based artist, did this, uh, uh, you know, we're all familiar with that poster of Obama, the flat poster, millions of them all around, but there's artwork that was done from it, and it's really a collage and very interesting, and when you go to the portrait gallery, I mean, this, you know, sits next to, in the portrait gallery, you know, like George Washington, <laughs> you know, the Gilbert Stewart and everything, and you see Shepard Ferry's subliminal messages. <laughs> it's really a collage, it's an interesting uh, piece of uh, artwork. I found it interesting that hope wasn't the original word. No, no, he used he used several. There was ch there was change. There was uh, there was hope, and he worked with the the campaign actually on coming up, you know, with with the word that would uh, be okay with the White House. Uh, you know, you've talked, John, about how objects come to us in different forms and different ways. Uh, this object came to us in this package. This isn't the way. Anybody know what this is? The package of the Hope Diamond? Yes, postage two dollars and forty four cents. <laughs> Now we saved the Hope Diamond, that's on display, but we also saved the package as a, as a museum uh, object, and so that was inside it. Harry Winston, who, who had a jewelry store actually in Los Angeles, uh, uh, sent it to us and donated that to the country. Uh, Did he have tracking on that package? Uh, no, <laughs> no, no zip code, nothing. Smithsonian Institute, Washington. <laughs> Son of a gun, wow. But it got there. Uh, other objects come to us in other ways. Uh, you experienced that with the space shuttle here in Los Angeles. We had the space shuttle Discovery delivered to us on top of this 747. Those flybys flew around the mall a few times. <laughs> they liked flying with a crowd. And then we put the Enterprise that we had in the collection, you know, nose to nose with the Discovery. And John Glenn and about 40 other astronauts were there for that. It was quite a, quite a thing. I think just like the pictures out of Los Angeles of the, you know, space shuttle coming down the streets. It's really an amazing kind of juxtaposition and the space shuttle is there today. Uh, and then we get other kind of deliveries. Uh, we have object number 71 in the collection, which was the pandas. Remember Nixon went to China, we got the pandas. And recently, we've had 71A, which is a little panda club born at the zoo. So in the book, you know, there's more. I mean, this is just uh, scratching the surface, but I think try to get you, you know, give you a sense of the tenure of this, tenor of this book. It, it, it tries to deal with these chapters in American history in a light, entertaining way, but also substantive, getting at the history of our country uh, and, uh, and doing that in a way that I think is very accessible. When I saw this in the table of contents, I said, why are we putting that you know, Chinese symbol in our book, but the, the story you tell is the history of how it changed us as a country. Yeah, and you know, these, the, the, the pandas were originally an object of cultural diplomacy, you know, of opening up relations with China. Now, in the book, I tell what the Americans gave to the Chinese. You know, this was an exchange with the Chinese government. You don't just get something, you have to give something. You got it. Somebody in the audience has said it. Musk ox. Musk ox. <laughs> I think we got the better of the deal. <laughs> Indeed we did. So Wonderful story. I think that's the, that's the jaunt. There's a lot more, so um, 
Anyway. The book is organized by eras. Mm -hmm. Time is the, is the major divider. It's not a list of 101 favorite items and we end up with the big story. Did you have a favorite? Were there favorites in there? You know, it, it, kind of like your children, they're all favorites. <laughs> so uh, I had a good time. I really learned by doing this. Um, and, um, you know, just, just learned a lot and got it. Now, you know, it depends on the audience. Sometimes I'll say which one is my favorite. So I, I did a presentation in New York, and I'm a New Yorker, you know, as I said, born in the South Bronx, raised in Queens. So in New York, somebody asked me that question, what's your favorite? I said, well, what's my favorite? The Statue of Liberty. They said, well, the Statue of Liberty is in New York. It's not in the Smithsonian. I said, that's the second one. That's right. The first one is in the Smithsonian. <laughs> And that's the model that that's the, the artist model. used, yep. absolutely. And it's in the book. Um, is there a right way or a wrong way to read the book? Do you just go front to back or do you bounce around? Should you? Uh, I, I think any way you can read it front to back because you know, it's roughly chron uh, chronological and you know, history builds on itself. Uh, but um, you know, it's hard to understand the civil rights movement without understanding you know, the Civil War, uh, you know, slavery, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, and so on. But a lot of people, if you want to read, if you're a music teacher and you just want to pull out all the music, mm -hmm. you can start with those Say Can You See and you know, work your way through the book. So uh, if you're interested in art, you can do it that way. If you're interested in uh, political history, you can do it that way. Airplanes, as you said, or air and space. So I think there's different ways of reading it. You, 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 uh, I think it's episodic. Each one is paired, each chapter is paired with a wonderful uh, color photograph of the object and about a five or six page essay. So it's very convenient. You know, it's easy to read. I asked you on the phone, is this, is the goal of the project to get people to buy and read the book or to get people who read the book to go see the museum? Uh, what, what would you like to see as the outcome of the, of the success of this book? Well, I'd like, you know, I'd like people to be exposed to it so that they, again, get a, a stronger sense of our history and they become curious. I think the book is a kind of teaser, if you will, I hope they go see not only the Smithsonian, but museums closer to home. And you know, I kind of also hope in this, you know, because when you think of some of the objects, they can seem very, uh, you know, some of them, of course, are associated with celebrity and famous events and people. But you know, think about that Brownie camera. You know, the, 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 it was so plain that everybody has. And so I, I would hope people also use it as a way of, of thinking about the, the, the material around them why it is, where it comes from, what its consequences have been, what its future might be. That is, I, I, I'm hoping it actually can make uh, curating life a little more interesting. I was going to ask you, as a curator, were there things out there that you covet that you wish the Institute owned that, that you could have put in the book that you weren't allowed to? Not that I wasn't allowed to, but the stuff that other people have that I'd love to get my hands on. <laughs> and then the stuff just, you know, the, the, you know dealing with the uh, railroad and the locomotive, you know, the golden spike. Oh, sure. You know, great object. Uh, folks at Stanford have that. I think they're pretty partial to it and not quite going to give it up. Uh, and then, um, but there's some things that are missing. So everybody go home tonight. Go, go, go to your basement. Go to your attic. Look behind some old picture. Because one of the things that is missing is probably the most signal object in the history of America. It is the original Declaration of Independence. So just like that, uh, what was the film, National Treasure? You know, the, yeah. the, the, the Nicholas Cage. Yeah, right? Nicholas Cage and stuff. The, 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 the one in the National Archives is the calligraphed version. That, was, that wasn't done until a few weeks after July 4th. It wasn't signed until November. Some people didn't sign it until November. So the first, and Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of Independence, Ben Franklin edited it, thank goodness. <laughs> and then they printed a copy. There was a printer across the street. So the first copy is really printed, not the one with all those signatures. Signatures came later. But there was a version that they all agreed to, the copy that they sent that printer in Philadelphia on July 4th. And that one is missing from history. And it'd be wonderful to find that. And if you find that, you too could donate it to the Smithsonian. <laughs> For a tax-deductible contribution. <laughs> there was a rowing event in the Olympics, I believe, in 1912. And the American eight showed up, and it was the eight with coxswain. And they didn't have a young coxswain. They didn't have a little, little uh, crew member. So they pulled a kid out of the crowd, a 10-year-old kid. They said, sit there and don't do anything. 
The American Eight won the gold medal. Nine medals were awarded. This little kid got a gold medal, and he ran off into the audience before history got his name. You don't even know who it is. Wow. There's a little wow. Kid. So sort of like, but I'd never heard the original Declaration of Independence is lost yep. to, to, to the records. There must have been items that almost made the cut, heartbreak items. Anything you want to tell us about? Uh, well, there's, uh, th you know, a lot of people are partial to the teddy bear, named after Teddy Roosevelt, child's toy. I would have liked to include a child's toy in it, but, you know, <laughs> 101 is tough. Uh, so uh, uh, that didn't uh, make it in. Um, I'm sure I'm going to get, uh, uh, you know, uh, people wanted Barbie, I wanted baseball cards, a glove, you know, great memorabilia. Uh, you know, uh, the, the film uh, 42 came out while this was on, and we didn't really have at the Smithsonian any good Jackie Robinson me memorabilia that I would have loved. We had some things from the Negro Leagues. Um, you know, you're always looking. Uh, we had talked about, you know, because of your history in the Olympics, I wanted to do something with Jim Thorpe, and it would have been great to do something, uh, you know, the uh, Olympic medals that were sure. then taken away, but we don't have them. We had some trophies and medals that he, he got before the Olympics, and we have the, the original Wheaties box when he was oh. finally on the Wheaties. He was the first. Yeah, 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 so wow. we have that. I like that. Well, Pasadena is very proud of Jackie Robinson. He's a native, and his brother, as you may or may not know, was a silver medalist behind Jesse Owens, Mac Robinson, and yeah. they have two large busts in front of City Hall here in Pasadena, so we're very proud of these people. Yeah. Uh, let's open it up to the audience. Maybe you've got some questions for us. Raise your hand. We have a producer coming forward with a microphone. Wait for the microphone. Please stand. Announce your name so we can credit. There's a hand up over here. If you'd stand up, please, we'll come to you with a microphone and tell us your name and uh, the question real loud. Yeah. Hi, I'm Paul Felix. Um, I'm just curious, is that Ark of the Covenant in the, in the museum? <laughs> <laughs> Where is the lost Ark? Well, can I swear your audience to secrecy? <laughs> um, I can't answer that question. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. No, okay. we don't have the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> and, and I don't think we even have the stage prop. <laughs> OK, Janice. Yeah. We do have a lot of arcs, though, in the We do have oh, yeah. arcs in the Smithsonian, religious arcs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, 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 collections of uh, Jewish material that were made at the Smithsonian. There was actually one I was kind of wanted to include, but, uh, you know, and tell the story of immigration to this country. But, you know, this country is made out of immigrants. There's so many stories to tell. I think maybe that's another. Is it possible itself. the institutions lost things that they've had? At 137 million, could you misplace one? Uh, are you a member of Congress? <laughs> <laughs> Fair this, is what we, this is what we get asked all the time. Where's George Washington's teeth? Have you guys lost that? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Stern, how are, why are you convinced that the original copy of the Declaration actually exists? Wouldn't it have been part of the day with, once the printer printed the copy, he would just destroy or throw out the original? Well, that, that, that indeed is the question. You know, that is it went over, we know it went over to John, Dun John Dunlop printed it up. And so that's the broadside that was then sent to uh, George Washington to read in New York. He was fighting the British at the time. It was sent all over the country. Different copies were made. And, but we don't know whether Dunlop just you know, took that, threw, <laughs> you know, threw that in a basket, or whether you know, put it aside and it ended up being taken out and some kid you know, walked off with the papers. We, so, we don't know. We don't know whether it was destroyed or not. I kind of like the idea that it might exist. You know, it's kind of wishful thinking. It may not, but it's kind of hopeful that yeah. you'll find that some way. We do have Jefferson's draft. Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence. Smithsonian has the desk that he wrote it on, uh, and uh, the Library of Congress has his draft, you know, with crossed. I mean, it's great when you're looking at historical documents. And we have in the American History Museum uh, a section, the Albert Small uh, Documents Gallery, and you could see these documents and the fact that, you know, these are handwritten by people, and just like you or I would, well, now we're, you know, doing it, word processing and editing, but, you know, when you think about history, you know, people crossing out words and George Washington crossing out a word and putting another word and really thinking about stuff. And so when you see these things, these are, this is the evidence of history. This shows us really the processes of how history is made. It's, it's really intriguing. It's quite, quite Is strange. it different for you to look at the real thing versus us looking at a picture of the real thing? Yeah, I think so. I, th I, I, I think, you know, people understand authenticity. 
And look, you know, you, you can look at a picture of the Lombardi Trophy in football, or you can hold that trophy. You can hold a medal, well an Olympic medal, you know, or you can look at a picture. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, the, just the fact that you're holding, I think it, it's the idea somehow this is rubbing off on me, I'm participating in this, I'm there. I, we do it with celebrity. You know, you're, you, you, you see a celebrity on TV or you see a celebrity in person. Then in person you want to be closer. You want to get your picture taken with the celebrity. If you could shake hands, have a hug, kiss, <laughs> anything closer. So I think there's an idea that somehow this stuff, the stuff almost rubs off. It's almost a very magical, basic, human kind of thing to connect with things. Well, and now you're bidding against eBay, too. All the collectors want to buy the piece of chewing gum that Justin Timberlake left on the you know, chair somewhere. I mean, I'm not sure you're fight fighting for that item, but my point is that there's all sorts of collectors out there now vying against the Institute for the privilege of holding that. That's right. I think officially I could say tonight we are not bidding <laughs> on that chewing gum. He's a gum. Question over here. Please stand up. My name is Otis Bowen from LA, and I have a question. Did you ever look for the um, first American dollar bill? A good question. Uh, or we a penny or yeah. any kind of dime. Stuff. Yes, we have a lot of the early, you know, remember during colonial times in America, each state, you know, there were different banks and people were issuing their own currency. So, you know, part of the whole notion of bringing the United States together was to get a common cur currency, uh, postage stamps, things like that, you know, that, that would help to run the country. So the Smithsonian has a wonderful, wonderful numismatic collection of, um, you know, of the first coinage and, and, and bills and so on. Does somebody at the National Mint give you the $100 bill that says 0000000001? Yeah, it's a, well, no, but we do have the $100,000 bill. That's yeah, monopoly that's money pretty there. good. That's that right was there. pretty good, yeah. yeah. And according to the national budget, that's about one-tenth of a second. Of <laughs> any other questions over here on the left? Maybe we'll get a couple more. You only have time for a couple more, but uh, keep your hand up. We'll come to you. Hi, I'm Aaron Strader. Um, did you guys uh, think about curating anything, or pu I'm rather putting anything in book regarding architecture or medicine? Uh, medicine, yes. Um, one of the poignant things uh, we have in the book I have in the book is um, is uh, Jonas Salk's uh, polio vaccine, and so we have at the Smithsonian. You know, polio came in three large categories: the vaccine, and so we have those three test vials, and we have the syringe that Jonas Salk used in those first trials. Um, and you know, that, it also tells a great story about America because it was America's giving that did that. That was the March of Dimes. That was the whole thing you know, with Roosevelt and the Americans sending in dimes and, uh, to help conquer polio. And at that time, for those you know, old, old enough to uh, remember, you know, polio was tremendously feared. I mean, there were quarantines, people not sending their kids to school and camp and swimming pools. And so defeating that disease was something the American people did together. And uh, Jonas Salk, uh, you know, of course, you had Sabin also working. We have some of his material, but we have that. We, we do have the pill, uh, the, the first trials of the birth control pill, and the dispenser uh, that was not made by the company, but was made, you know, it's that lock pack, you know, uh, with the, day, you know, the, the days of the week and so on uh, that was made. That's in the uh, uh, Smithsonian. Architecture, uh, I needed to tell the story of steel in this country. Steel really built the country in terms of industrial revolution. Uh, so I needed to tell Carnegie's story in a way. And the Smithsonian has a mu not an object, but we have a whole museum, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum in New York on Fifth Avenue that used to be Carnegie's mansion. <laughs> and we're doing the renovation. As we were doing the renovation, we were stripping away. And you could see all the steel you know, beams labeled Carnegie. So I actually used that building, which was Carnegie's private residence made out of steel, the first real steel residence in the country, to tell the story of architecture at that time during the Gilded Age. There's another one uh, over here. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Katie. I was wondering how many, um, do you have a lot of traveling exhibits and does, are, are there things on loan in all the states? Good, great, great question. So the Smithsonian has 137 million things, specimens, ranging from those pandas. Some of our, some of our specimens have to be fed every day, <laughs> right? Animals at the zoo. At any one time, we have about five and a half million objects on loan. 
to other museums and research facilities. So it's a huge amount, and it's not easy to you know, keep track of. So we have those objects on loan. In terms of traveling exhibits, the Smithsonian has something called the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibit Service. And basically, every day in the United States, one of our exhibits is going up, and another is coming down somewhere in the United States. So we hit about 600 cities and communities across the states with, you know, I think we're touring Star Wars now. We have another exhibit on first ladies' gowns. Uh, at any one time, about 60 or 70 exhibits that are traveling around the United States. There's a lot of people watching on the live uh, webcast. Is there a website you can go and, and search for items that the Smithsonian has? Sure. Uh, the main item is www.si, not Sports Illustrated, Smithsonian Institution, <laughs> .edu. That's the tell. So, uh, and then if you're on the Smithsonian site or you just want to Google Yahoo Bing, do a search, if you type in uh, Smithsonian Collections, you too can have access to about 8 million digital records. Now, we, it's going to take us a while to digitize 137 million objects and, and the records, but we have about 8 million online. So you can put together your own book. You could put together, you could search in the Smithsonian to see if a you know, treasured item is there uh, and curate your own, uh, you know, your own show, your own exhibit. Wonderful. I, uh, okay, we're going to go over here to the right side. Hi, Mary Bowen, Los Angeles. Otis's mom. Um, if we were thinking of taking a trip to the to Washington to the Smithsonian, all the institutions, would it be a week, four days, if you got it all in? Just a little tourist information, if you uh, wouldn't yeah. mind. Okay, great. No, um, I, you know it's good to go online because I, I think there's really good guidance. Again, we're used to processing and hosting about 30 million people through the Smithsonian. Um, I think for the Smithsonian, you really need a plan on a week, and you won't be disappointed. Um, you know, during the uh, some months, the museums get very crowded. I mean, we, we've had over 100,000 people in one day in the Air and Space Museum moving through. American History Museum gets about 5.5 million people a year going through it. I mean, these are massive uh, 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 operations. Uh, but then some of the other museums, the, some of the art museums, the African Art Museum, the Postal Museum, the, you know, there's treasures that are part of the Smithsonian. And of course, if you're going to Washington, you want to go to the Library of Congress, the National Archives as well, see the National Monument. So I kind of think a week in, you know, a week in Washington is a good, you know, makes a great v vacation. Somebody in the front, I thought I saw the hand right here. Stand up, please. Stand up, please. There you go. Lou Ann Tesserero, Los Angeles. Whose image is on the $100,000 bill? <laughs> Great question. I want to say, is it Woodrow Wilson? I don't know. I think it's. Don't ask I me. Think, I, I, believe, I think it's Woodrow I, I, Wilson. I, I, is it Chase? I don't know. I, you, gotta, you better look it up. Look it up. I, you know, they don't. Look, I'm just the I. secretary of the Smithsonian. They don't give it, you know, they don't let me play with it. But. Is it That's Chase? It. Is, it, is, it, is it still legal tender? No, it wasn't. It was created just for a transfer. Oh, okay. Yeah, so wasn't, well, it wasn't circulating like you're going to get it mixed up in a 20 or... <laughs> okay, on, the, on this side over but here? But check it, check it out. I, you know, I, it is, is it oh, Wilson? Okay. Our, our live score, research... Score, score a point for the Smithsonian, right? I got it right. Okay, we'll draw Wilson. Good. You know, I, I, I did, we did a program at the Smithsonian about um, a, a few weeks ago. A friend of mine, Mickey Hart, the drummer for the Grateful Dead, he's helped the Smithsonian a lot. He's helped re-engineer our recordings in our archives. Uh, and, and so he's you know, helped us out. And so many people helped the Smithsonian way. And then we were doing a program at the Air and Space Museum with George Smoot, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on the Big Bang. And Mickey Hart right now is trying to sonify the universe. So he, he's working with the Smithsonian. He calls our astrophysics. He says, hey, Richard, what does you know, like Jupiter sound like? You know, what does Cassiopeia sound like? And he's working with uh, George Smoot, uh, um, uh, a Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist. So he's talking to George Smoot. And he had gone on, are you smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> and so somebody in the audience at the Smithsonian was sitting in the auditorium, the Air and Space Museum, Mickey Hart's, you know, and, and George Smoot's doing that. And he says, how would it have been if you couldn't answer the question? Just imagine a Nobel Prize winner, not as smart as a fifth grader. That's frightening. Over here. Thank you, Mike Reddick. 
Does the Smithsonian buy things? And if so, what percentage is donated versus purchased? Uh, I, I would say about 99.9% per, .9 of the items are donated. So it really is, and, and we depend a lot on collectors, you know, who, who help us out. Uh, you know, who have collections in their own lifetime and then they look at it, maybe their kids aren't as interested in it. Or sometimes, you know, a collection to care for it, you know, it's a lot of upkeep. Uh, you know, security, care, and so on. And sometimes they'll say, you know, a larger national purpose. I want, just like I've enjoyed this during my lifetime, I want American citizens and people from other countries to enjoy it. So most, items are donated, we will get some items that we will pay for, we'll do an acquisition, uh, we'll even get a few items at auction. Uh, but by and large, it's, uh, it's donation. What's the criteria for deciding to spend money on something versus hoping it'll be given to you? Well, I think it's, you know, really whether it's, it, it's gonna be available, and you know, we won't bid, we, you know, we're not, you're not gonna get a bidding war between the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian and the National Archives. Uh, it's not the best use of, uh, of those funds. Um, but if we feel that something really is significant and important and it's going to go out of the country, it's gonna go into private hands, we might not know what's gonna happen. And really, the, our curators really are the first line. They, they're the ones that say, hey, this is really, really significant. Uh, we, need a, we need to purchase this. And sometimes we'll look for donors to help us do it. You know, we had a, there's a, a wonderful uh, donor of the National Archives a few years ago who bought a copy of the Magna Carta for the country, David Rubenstein, and paid $21 million for the Magna Carta to put it on display. But he got a nice tax deduction. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, yeah. Hello, David Schwartz. Um, I was just wondering, did any maps make it in or were even considered since there are so many were used to chart the progress and the changes of this nation? You are absolutely right. Number 10 on the list <laughs> is a uh, new map of America in the Smithsonian. And I also talk about the, uh, uh, the uh, Universalis map uh, that's also in the Library of Congress that was the first map that named America. And interesting enough, when America was first named you know, on maps after America, Amerigo Vespucci, it was applied to South America, not North America. And South America was much more well known, the South America and the Caribbean, and you look on those early maps, and people thought North America was really Florida and Cuba <laughs> and Hispaniola. The rest of the, you know, the rest of the country is kind of very blank. So I, I think maps are really poignant because they give us a sense of, you know, what, what, what the continent, uh, what the future United States looked like in the eyes of those people who were first exploring. Imagine 50 years ago, what would have made in the collection? What do you think 50 years from now wow. the collection might include? Well, that's tough. You know, we're, we're right now we're building it on the, on the mall next to the Washington Monument, a new museum of African American history and culture. Uh, and um, great group of people, great collect people are coming out with collections. Uh, well, let me go like 60 years ago, post-World War II. Uh, one of the items I showed and I talk about in the book is the Medal of Honor won by Christian Fleetwood. He was an African-American soldier in the Civil War, and he won the Medal of Honor during the Siege of Petersburg. His granddaughter tried to donate that to the Smithsonian. Now, this was in the late 40s, same year as Jackie Robinson, same year as segregation in this country. And the Smithsonian curators at that, at that time said, we will not take that medal. It's not worthy of the national collections. Because we, if we, take in this material, who knows what other stuff is gonna come in. It wasn't a question of provenance, it was. No, it wasn't a question of provenance at all. It was good, it, you know, this was where our country was at. So it, it kind of gives you perspective. Now, at that time, the, thankfully, the Secretary of the Smithsonian overruled the curators and said, this is a Medal of Honor won by an African-American soldier fighting for his freedom in the Civil War. Of course it's gonna be part of the collection. And so, but you look at what, you know, people think is significant at times, and a, a case like that is almost shocking because it's so strong. But, you know, there's cases of artwork that we think are, uh, you know, uh, well, you look at this find in Germany now. You know, the, the Nazis called this degenerate art. You know, this was Picasso in Chicago. And, you know, art that's tremendously valuable that we highly regard, but at that time it was degenerate art. It wasn't, you know, they didn't think it was worth it. Well, at least publicly. <laughs> Um, so things, things do change. I think, uh, you know, 50 years ago, uh, from now when somebody else is writing this book, <laughs> 
Uh, I think there'll, there'll certainly be new technological innovations and inventions. Uh, I think there'll be new um, uh, social advances in our country, cult new cultural products, and those things will, will take their place in the book, and that, that, that's good. Our history is in that way, uh, cumulative and active. You know, this is a country where history doesn't, doesn't stop. You know, some places in the world you look at culture, you know, history almost seems to stop. With Americans, it doesn't. It is a story emerging. And that's what I find so wonderful about this. This is a book not about history of America that was. This looks at this stuff when it was news. Thomas Edison, when we did that light bulb, was front page news. <laughs> it wasn't meant as a museum object. It was meant to light and change the world. And so I think looking at history, you have to look at it at the time, what it meant at, the, at, at that time and what its significance is. Well, I'm, as history continues to roll on, other items are making their way to the, the, the man sitting in your chair 50 years from now. Sadly, our time is almost up. Any one last question? Or, uh, well, there's two hands up. I'm going to go in. We heard from you before, did we? Or no? Is this your first? And then please stand up, sir. I'm John Mirho. I live here in Pasadena. My question is, you've got 137 million items in the Smithsonian. Have you ever graphed it per year, for example, 1620 Plymouth Rock, or 1903 the Kitty Hawk, and have you graphed it one? And it, would there be significance to, let's say you've got 20 million objects for 1920, would you like interpret that as meaning 1920 might be a more popular year, or might be a more significant year historically in the United States? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a great, it's a great, um, it's a great question, and you know, in some ways, it depends on those collections that we acquired. You know, when um, when you think about that, you can definitely see rises in the Smithsonian uh, collections documenting, for example, the Civil War. You know, where huge troves of photographs came into the Smithsonian. You know, thousands and thousands from you know Matthew Brady and Gardner and the other people documenting it. So. You know, we, 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 we get, um, that does happen. You do see spikes. Now, I would just say with your timeline, you need to stretch your timeline. The oldest item in the Smithsonian is four and a half billion years old. What is that? Meteorite, not from Earth. And so we have a whole collection of meteorites that come from, you know, around the solar system and around the galaxy that fall to Earth. And the, they go to the Smithsonian in the special room and we take extra care of those kind of meteorites. So, you know, our, our, our timeline is, is kind of huge. Now, a lot of the items, we need a lot of them to say something. So we have millions of birds. Those birds are very useful as a kind of library of DNA, of understanding, you know, speciation and so on. So, so sometimes it's not good to have just one item. <laughs> sometimes you need a whole set of items to make sense of it, particularly when you're doing things like DNA analysis. But I was interested in the question as in terms of metadata, do you ever look back at your items and try to glean, I don't know, causation as well as correlation? Uh, I think, you know, we do. And, um, and, and increasingly now, what we're, the job is so big, right? I mean, 137 million items. So now we're actually starting, we have some presidential fellows, and we're trying to use uh, thousands, probably end up tens of thousands, maybe millions of volunteers to help us catalog the Smithsonian collection. A lot of the records are handwritten. A lot of that metadata is handwritten and has to be transcribed. So I think you know, we're looking to enlist the American people in an effort to really understand this treasure trove that you could never do with a few hundred curators or scientists. What's the next largest museum to the Smithsonian Institute? That would be very, very tough. You know, the Louvre- Half as large? Oh, no, no, no one has anywhere near the kind of collection. When you're talking about in terms of collection, 137 million, no, nothing. I mean, the uh, museum, you know, usually natural history museums have uh, big collections because they have a lot of specimens. Okay. <laughs> so those run into the millions. The Museum of Natural History in New York, the Field Museum, the British Museum, certainly. Uh, in terms of the world. When it comes to, you know, art museums, a big art museum might have 300, 400,000 items. That's huge. Right. Most art museums will have between five and, oh, 30,000 items. And the percentage of the Smithsonian Institute bu budget that comes from the government? About 60%. We're about a $1.3 billion a year operation. About $750 million comes from the federal government. Uh, 
250 million comes from philanthropy, about 150 million from grants and contracts. We actually run some space satellites for NASA. Mm. Uh, we have 500 people in Panama doing research on tropical biology, uh, people in Kenya and other things. So, uh, and then, um, you know, sales through the shop, the magazine, Smithsonian Magazine, and our books. And the book, <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be a huge percentage, I'm sure, of the revenue. There was one last question and then we'll close. Uh, I saw the hand up, go ahead, stand up, please. James Smith, uh, Pasadena. Uh, I had a question similar to his, but given, given a graph of, of, of when things come in, have you ever gone back and said, looking at it year over year, I've noticed historically things happen a lot in April and August. Oh, that's interesting. And then those are the times of full moons or something. I, yeah, I, I, you know, it'd be an interesting exercise. Um, if you'd care to volunteer, yeah. we'd be happy to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the issue of when the thing was made, right? And then it's when it actually came into the collection. I think the, the, the acquisition thing is, you know, are people more generous about donations in the spring or, you know, or in the fall? Um, it may depend. You know, some things happen because of tax season. You know, mm -hmm. and people looking for tax deductions, so that, that happens too. Well, listen, uh, the doctor has graciously agreed to autograph copies of the book, so if you give us a moment, maybe he'll wait, make his way, but let's hear it for Dr. Richard Curran from the Smithsonian Institute. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, and thank you all. <laughs>